If you have a history of trauma, I know you know how much it can come back and trigger thoughts and behaviors and limits that hurt your work life, that drag down your hopes of advancement in your career. Hardly anybody talks about this, and I don't know why. It's such an important part of life. Of course, the symptoms of childhood PTSD can hold you back at work. And I'm gonna walk through some ways it does that and how you can turn it around. Not just so that you have a fair chance at success and professional fulfillment in your life, and of course, financial security, hello, but because doing work that's meaningful to you, feeling some sense of accomplishment, some personal growth through your work, it's part of how to build a happy life. Now, at any level, work can be stabilizing. It can be a path to overcome the chaos of your childhood. It can be a way to overcome poverty. It's certainly been that for me. And work connects you to the world. And I know some jobs are horrible. I've had some of those too. I know what it's like to have to do work you hate just because you need the money to survive. But work gets us up in the morning. It draws us out into the world, into interactions with other people. It can be a second chance to learn how life works. And it can be a place where you come into your own, where you blossom. Now, even if you don't have that now, even if work is so triggering for you, you're just like, you know, locking yourself in, there is a path out. And I encourage you to set your sight on that path. Working is a large part of life. And even when work is menial, our engagement with it can be healing and uplifting. It can be a way to bring more good into the world. And that's really important too. So how do you do that? How can a person with a history of trauma rise up like that to become a person who finds joy on the job, who becomes an agent of goodness and of usefulness, who brings peace and comfort and order to environments that would otherwise be, you know, hard hearted or chaotic. Work is a way you can encourage other people and they need that work is one place where parts of who you really are can show up. And of course, work is a way well, to get money. Let's talk about money. Money is how you have choices. Anyone who's ever been stuck and broke without work does not romanticize money. <laughs> of like, oh, money, it's just evil. It's like, no, money is choice. Money is survival and then money brings choices. Without money, you can be stuck in a terrible situation. You could be trapped in a bad relationship. So it's so important to learn how you can generate money through work so that always, no matter what's going on in your life, you're fulfilled and you have choices. All right, so what are some of the childhood PTSD symptoms that can show up at work and hold you back? Number one, you end up working for people in organizations that untraumatized people would know not to work for. There are people who are abusive, dishonest, exploitative, it's not safe. And there is this tendency in people who grew up having to crap fit, to fit themselves to unacceptable situations at home, to be just too good at it. It's time to stop. Stop fitting yourself to bad things. Begin to get clear about what your standards are, about what is an appropriate, good, decent, workable situation where you can do your job. What kind of people do you need to work for? Get clear about this. This is one of, one of my symptoms of CPTSD is feeling like I just get sort of like buffeted around and end up in jobs like the only job that came along in the little that I was able to look for a job because I was really depressed or, you know, the, the first place that hired me. In my life, I've paid the price for not, for not exercising choice. And I've ended up in situations where I was really unhappy and I spent all my energy kind of pushing back against the thing I didn't like about the job rather than going, I don't like this job, I'll go somewhere else. And luckily, ever since I've been in the process of healing my trauma, you know, which is basically like 29 years now, I've been coming up and up and up. So things that fit me when I was younger, less experienced, but also still really underneath the weight of my trauma symptoms. Well, I'm in a different league now, and I've been in progressively better leagues all along where I could learn to, like, I could do good customer service now that I don't have loss of control of my emotional you know, state will be just because I'm triggered. I have a way to, you know, compartmentalize that, put it aside, deliver the good customer service, and then go off and use my tools to deal with the dysregulation that happens. 
So you can really change your station in life by learning to work with your own symptoms. But for gosh sakes, do not get into work situations that are only going to make it worse. And don't kid yourself that just staying in a bad situation at work, that just staying there. Well, OK, I know the thing that you should have, you know, you should keep your job until you've got another one lined up. I know that. But you have to weigh that against what happens to your spirit and your psyche when you sit there and take abuse. And what happens, and this is true in romantic relationships and just bad situations in general, you get eroded when you tolerate bad situations like that, bad treatment. It wears you down until, you know, you'd be at a job interview and you'd be like, hi, I know I'm not worth very much, but I thought I'd try. You know, you can't, you can't bring that energy and spirit that you need for the job interview. So staying in the job isn't everything. And I know money is always a consideration, but please take care of your spirit so that abuse doesn't wear you down to the point that you can't even try to take your step onward and out. Number two, you end up working for someone who is funnily very similar to your abusive parent. And you fall into the same role that you once played in, in response to that person, whether that's people pleasing, overworking, rebelling against them, getting resentful or immobilized or suffering because you're not seen. That was my thing. You know, I wasn't really seen by, by my mom and I just kept getting bosses who would just completely overlook me. And no, they were not reading my mind or looking out for my best interest. And I later learned like what you have to do. You have to ask for the raise. You have to state what you feel that you would like to be doing and how much you should be paid for it. And then if they won't do it, you go somewhere else. I didn't do that for a long time because I was very insecure about whether I deserved more. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Sometimes though, not working for the type of person can help you not play your old role. So, you know, CPTSD symptoms are sticky like that. So that role, you know, the role where I become like the long suffering overlooked Cinderella that I had in my family of origin, you know, <laughs> they all get to go to the ball. I have to stay home and scrub the chimney or whatever. That was, it's a little bit of a metaphor for what it was like for me, but I kept playing that role in jobs. I, like literally everybody went off to a, a conference once, a conference that I was really like probably the person who most should have been at it. And when they came back, they said, here, transcribe the recording. I remember that there was a moment of clarity. I'm like, I'm out of here. This is like, this is wrong. <laughs> but I had enough healing. I think that was maybe like three, four years into my healing when I was like, wait a minute, this isn't right. I actually am really good. It's a long story, but I wrote a book on the topic of the conference and nobody else had. And, uh, yeah, it was actually like a bad dynamic with the boss. The boss had some sort of like, I don't know. I don't even know what. I don't even need to know. I think it was like competition or sexism. Who knows? I just know I needed to not work there anymore. And now I don't. So yay. <laughs> okay, this is number three. The person you work for is actually fine, but you parentify them anyway, waiting for them to realize how good you are. Um, and feeling jealous of the favor that they show to other people, waiting for them to give you better duties and a raise. You don't ever advocate for yourself and you end up resentful and not giving your best. So this is another version of like the abusive parent, but how about, you know, the boss is fine, but the old parent dynamic, you're coming up and projecting your half of it. Like there's no way I'm going to be treated fairly. There's no way my needs are going to be met. They're against me. I can't, I can't. So when that's operating, that can really hold you back too. Like nobody has any idea that that's going on in your head, but they're soon going to notice the outward manifestations, you know, the way that you kind of resist and hunch up against, against growth and opportunities or questions or difficulty. And, and so, you know, I always want to remind people it's, it, it makes sense sometimes to contain your feelings and to behave and to be appropriate, even when your thoughts are inappropriate, <laughs> you know, that you can't get away with expressing them. But the thing is, we all have a nervous system. So in a way you can't really hide what's going on. People can feel it. And just for example, when somebody's like really angry and you go, is something wrong? You seem angry. And they go, no, I'm not angry. You know, they are. If your nervous system works, you can feel it. I've heard theories that our nervous systems are like one giant organism, really, you know, and in a way that makes sense to me. That's how we have collective conscience, perhaps. That's how sometimes we have intuition about others. We actually have some form of connection that... Uh, may or may not be, you know, if, if it's physical, it's on some atomic level. I don't know what it is, 
but I just know I can't hide how I really feel. And so the healing has to happen for me to be perceived as not angry, as not terrified. You know, I have to honestly be who I present myself to be. That said, I, I totally believe that sometimes you fake it till you make it. Sometimes you act as if, sometimes you pretend you're brave and you start your first day of a new job, you know, even though it is frightening and there's a lot of doubts and all that. So sometimes we do that. But just remember, people can sense it. Here's the thing. This is about parentifying your boss. Do not parentify your boss. They're not your parent. The other thing about parenting, parentifying your boss is it's a, it's, it's, it's a disordered dynamic right there because this is actually a contractual agreement. Now, a lot of times it becomes like family on a job, but it's a little different than a family in that they can fire you and that's it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's all. They can fire you or... They, it, it, there's so many things that can happen there that are not like a family. But a lot of times because we have fuzzy boundaries, because our emotional needs weren't met in our families, then that, that sort of need for a family kind of goes in and weaves its tendrils into the whole job situation. And what happens is if you're not treated fairly, if you're not invited to stay on another year, it can be devastating as if you've been cast out of your family which could have already happened in, in your actual family, right? So it's devastating for a person with those wounds from a family. So the way to head it off is to learn to have kinds of relationships and to be very clear with yourself through doing your homework, using your tools, having the support of a mentor. I really encourage you to do that. <laughs> tools and mentor, very potent combination. I can talk about that later in this video. But you want to do that so that you approach the job with actually a realistic dynamic, that you bring half of that dynamic in of like, this is a contractual arrangement. I, I have made an agreement with you that you will pay me if I do this job. And if I do this job well, that's one thing. And if I do this job badly, that's another thing. And if I would like things, if I would like to advance in this career, if I would like to get a raise, I really want to do the job well. I want to have a good relationship, but not one where I'm emotionally melting down, acting on like opening the portals of hell to those old childhood wounds and behaving as a rejected child. I was a rejected child and I have brought that energy to work and it doesn't make sense at work. And it's a very difficult position to put somebody in. And it's not something that tends to get you a raise or advancement. So you know, I, I can sort of, I can predict the comments from people who are feeling hurt by this and just feel like, but it's not fair. And I'm just going to say, yes, it is fair. A job is a contractual agreement. And if you've been at a job a long time, there are family like bonds there of loyalty. And, but, but in the end, in the end, a business has to look out for itself and sometimes at the expense of its people. That's how it works. And it's, hard, but it's how it is. And how it is, is a very good thing to be able to see, recognize, and work with. So other bonds are more permanent. Other bonds have other obligations, other, you know, to stick with you through thick and thin, to love you, even if you can't do your job, you know, that's a different bond. So there is so much, you know, my, my career was so liberated and set free. Like I was very stuck. Uh, I've often told people here, I couldn't get a job at McDonald's when I was 16. And I often got jobs because of my smarts, but a lot of because of the emotional energy I brought to jobs and um, that made me um, difficult, unreliable, kind of a handful at work. I didn't get along with some people too, a little too much of the time. I did not advance. They couldn't put me in charge of things. And so I often had this beautiful luxury of being able to create a job for myself, but it never involved moving up. And there was a real ceiling on how much money I could make. And that was not acceptable because for nine years, I was a single mom. I had to have enough money to get by. I had to do it. And so I did something different that when I learned this lesson and I left that job, I went and got this other job. And this was, a, I, I was very surprised. I got a 50% raise when I got a different job from the job that I had been, you know, very miserable and feeling stuck. Then later I went back to the old job and got another raise that was effectively double what I had made there in the past. And it was actually appropriate for my level and my education and for what I was contributing. 
the where the place that I was working, if I were if you were to ask me now, I wish I hadn't gone back there. Yes, I got money, but I was still working for the same people who didn't think I was worth it, who complained, you know, who didn't give me opportunities. And there were so many ways that that job was like having a terrible boyfriend, you know. I used to say that it's kind of like having a boyfriend who won't commit and you've had children already and they still won't commit. <laughs> and they won't help out and they won't, you know, that's what I I just it's like, well, that's interesting cuz that's what was going on in my real private life. That's what was going on. And that's what happens. Unhealed trauma leads us into trauma-driven behaviors that are just going to keep playing out as that thing that is unhealed. So I did, I just, I had not healed that part of me that I, it's hard to define. Like, why would I do that? Why would I get into a relationship and have kids with a guy who wouldn't commit to me? Why would I do that? It was a lot like the, the, the dynamics in my home. You know, I didn't have that kind of like diehard commitment from my mom and the, my dad, my, my birth dad, who did feel that way about me died when I was a teenager. And so I don't know, I just kept crap fitting myself. That was one area that I could crap fit really well. And so I did. And I was very driven by a fear. Like I'm never going to have anything. I should just take what I can get job wise, partner wise. I should just take what I can get. And, um, it all worked out. I'm very happy now and my life is full and, and I have kids and, <laughs> you know, it's, they're adult kids now. And so healing, you know, it's funny how our healed life can work with us wherever we come from. It can work with whatever wounds there are and life can unfold and be wonderful anyway. So don't worry. Don't worry if you've got problems right now. Don't worry if you're stuck in old patterns, but listen to me because I'm going to, I'm telling you a list of things at work that are, that can really hold you down. And you can start changing those even if you don't have everything worked out in your life. All right, you ready for another one? Okay, this is kind of an extension of the last one. And this is where, you know, you've you sort of slipped into a family dynamic at your job and all of your energy is about trying to make them get it about you. Where you, what you can do with that energy is to take it and improve your skills and your knowledge and your options. And I can't stress this enough. Like evidently this is what normal parents teach their kids. <laughs> so I'm teaching you now, have, having gone through this cycle and, 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 you know, moved through and had these opportunities finally open up to me. But it came from, you know, I went and got a master's degree and I actually didn't use that master's degree. It was very fancy and I thought it was what I wanted. But when I worked there, that was the job I really didn't like and I wasn't really using it. And one thing led to another and I've ended up creating creating three different businesses for myself. And I recommend this. If you have CPTSD and family dynamics have a way of leaking into your workplace, I just found having my own business and having clients that I served was a lot more clean and straightforward and not like a parent, not like a family. I sign an agreement with somebody. I work for them for a couple of months. I, I, used, to, I used to do customer service training as a consultant. Then I had a video production company and now I do Crappy Childhood Fairy and you're my client. And so when I, when I work directly with people like that and not through an employer doing something, it just really works for me and it's motivating to me. And if it ever goes south, which sometimes it does, I've had some very icky clients before, well, you, then you just don't work with them again. It's so cool. So you have a lot more mobility to keep making, you know, if you're a person who's changing dramatically because you're healing your past trauma, doing consulting and changing clients often is a way that you can kind of keep upping your game and not waiting for somebody else to decide if they're going to give you, you know, a promotion. I, that's never worked for me. That's never worked for me. In my younger days, I was a comedian in Hollywood. And before that, I had been trying to make it in acting, right? And I never did. I feel like I could really act now, but, <laughs> but when I was doing that, I had to wait for somebody to think I was the right person. And they'd be like, mm, well, you have kind of a character face and da da da, and you should get your nose fixed. They, you know, everything that I would ever have would be decided by somebody else. And I was like, you know what happens with comedians? They write their own ticket. <laughs> they, they write the role for themselves and anybody can get up on stage and do comedy. So these are just some examples of twists and turns in my career where I kept discovering where I could bring all my potential to bear. I think that my upbringing, I think that my trauma symptoms had really diminished and marked me as somebody not quite suitable for things that I actually was capable of. I had a lot of growth to do and I have set myself free. And honestly, crappy childhood fairy, everything I told you of the work that I've done before 
it all came together into this job. So you never know if you keep working on yourself and your skills, by the way, that video production company, I had to teach myself to edit on Google. I Googled, how do you edit video? That's how I did it. And then I started charging money for it and I got people to pay me. And eventually I hired a staff and, but I still, to this day, I do know how to edit video. I taught myself how to do it. So when people say, oh, I don't have an education. I'm like, okay, education is a thing. It's valuable. It's real. But if you need money right now, there are things you can teach yourself on this thing that we're on right now, which is the most powerful source of learning there has ever been in human history. There's quirks that I could complain about about YouTube, but it's all here. Like everything that you want to know how to do, it's here. And if you're motivated, you can teach yourself. So don't waste energy on some crappy boss who doesn't get you. Put your energy into learning things that you can either finally get recognized there or go somewhere where you are recognized. Like work is a joy. Work can be a wonderful way forward. I gave you a big speech about it at the beginning of this video about like, Money is important and it doesn't stop there. What's important is that connection to the world, that feeling of usefulness, the feeling of having somewhere you need to be every day because people are counting on you. These are the ingredients of happiness. I'm still talking about things that can hold you back and then what to do. So here's another one that can hold you back. And this is a, this may not apply to you, but it sure applies to a lot of people who had trauma. You're in a line of work that's like loaded with traumatized people. All right. So I used to work in a nonprofit that was about a political thing that was very divisive, <laughs> very life and death, very intense. And one day I realized that about 80% of the people who worked there were adult children of alcoholics like me. And when adult children of alcoholics haven't healed, that's a really common symptom is being very excited by drama, conflict, drama, you know, playing the good guy and getting in there. And, you know, I'm glad there are good guys out there doing this stuff, but it was a really sick environment for me. And when I healed, I had to get out of that office because being around all that like trauma, drama energy and just like, oh my God, oh my God, you're not going to believe what Congress did today. I just, and I was just like, oh, bleh, I want to get out. And then I also, I used to like the show ER and I just, I just like didn't anymore. I'm totally into shows that are high drama now. But when I was in my early recovery, I couldn't watch TV. That was, it was all about adrenaline. And it was just so funny because they were acting out these like terrible scenarios where you're just like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And then in, you know, I was about a year into recovery where I realized this was stressing me out. It was draining me. And, I, and what I was really seeking through my recovery was to have less drama, more calm, more just like connection to things, more awareness. So trauma and fear as entertainment has its place, right? It's like horror movies and roller coasters. I've loved all of those things in due time. <laughs> and I used to think, you know how, you know how when rock and rollers get old and they're like 80 and they do songs about like, I like to sit on the porch. It's a nice sunset. And I used to think, oh God, I never want to be like that. Well, now I'm like that. <laughs> now I'm like that. I like songs that bring me peace and sort of help me appreciate life. So we are where we are. Okay. <laughs> what I'm saying about the professions though, <laughs> trauma driven professions, um, uh, you know, emergency services person, you're, you're out there in the ambulance dealing with wrecks. A lot of people who are nurses, especially nurses in like a trauma unit or an ER, um, I don't need to tell you very, very highly populated with people who grew up with trauma. And the fact is most people find those jobs inhibiting to their ability to start changing their level of dysregulation. So that's a, that's a dilemma, right? You were drawn to it initially and now it's starting to be an obstacle. But you know, if you change careers midway, you'd be like me and a lot of other people, it's okay to change careers. And a lot of times what you've done before, is, is, is so helpful for educating people about some reality that you've worked in, you know, personally about stuff like I, I did. I worked in public health for 30 years. I know a lot about that. I know how to talk to people who work in public health. I know the sensibility. I know the way funding works there and how that can drive the agenda. I know how to work outside of that while being respectful to it. So this is a skill too, is being somewhere and leaving it. And you can do that. All right. Here's a, here's a characteristic that can get in the way of your career success. This one's kind of general trauma response. Okay. Fight, flight, freeze, fawn, fight. That's where you get very argumentative and high conflict. Um, flight, you escape, you run away, you drink, whatever. Fight, flight, freeze. Freeze is you just take crap. You don't do anything about it. 
uh, and fawn as you're like, oh, let me try to make you feel better. I'm sorry, I'm sorry you're mad at me, let me fix it. Okay, so those are four trauma responses. There may be others, right? Fix, um, other things that start with F. <laughs> That's a trauma response, right? <laughs> I won't go there. But your trauma responses are too strong. So when work is stressful, which it can be, your trauma responses come off and it's just too strong. You know, you're too argumentative. You're too escapist. You know, you don't show up for work. You call in sick when the going gets tough. You freeze. You take all these, all this abuse and you don't change jobs or you fawn. You keep trying to make them like you and see you and get you. See how I'm talking about trauma, ex trauma responses through all of this? So that's kind of a general one. I probably should have said this in the introduction, but but that's a, that's a thing that can get in your way. So trauma responses, they're natural. You want to kind of, we all have all of them at times and we tend to favor one or two of them. And you want to come back to center on that. So that instead of having a trauma response, you, you when you feel hurt and upset by something, you, your trauma response happens. You have a way to separate, process that, heal it, calm it down, and then show up again at work. Not delivering them your trauma response, but your solution, whether that's to leave, defend yourself, um, advocate for yourself, you know, <laughs> quiet quit. Yeah, I, quiet quitting sounds terrible to me. What a, what a waste of life that is. If you're going to work, make the most of it. That's my philosophy. Okay. Number seven is you haven't learned to manage your trauma symptoms. So to hide them, you're keeping your life small. All right. So I talk about a lot about like playing small, right? So your trauma symptoms, when you, before you have any recovery, they mess up everything. They ruin your opportunities. They make you look foolish, sad, crazy. <laughs> you know, they, they thwart you from getting what you want. So one way you can control your trauma symptoms is by keeping your life small. Don't go for jobs that are challenging. Don't be around people. Be alone. Do something really unchallenging in isolation. Those are, I mean, that's what we do, right? I'm not really exaggerating. That's what we do. Or just doing jobs that are so easy or so repetitive that you can just do that. Now, I think, I think an easy, repetitive job can be very therapeutic when you're in a certain place, but it's not suitable for your whole life. It's not suitable. And just like isolating, sometimes you, get, you need some time alone, but isolating for your whole life is not a great idea. And yes, yes, I hear the chorus of people who say, no, it's great, isolating's great, I really don't wanna do it. But you're so busted because you watch my videos. So I know you're working on yourself and I'm teaching you about relational stuff. So even if you're a person who loves solitude, learning this relational stuff is powerful and good stuff and hang in there. There, there are aspects of life. And if you don't believe me now, when you're old and you need some help to uh, take care of yourself or you're sick, you will see what I'm saying about the, how important it is to have people in your life. It's important. This is a big one. We could talk on and on and on about this. Number eight is emotional dysregulation. All right. This is probably the number one thing that gets in the way of of your advancement because emotional dysregulation rings you out. It can leave you with something very similar in your body to a hangover because you were crying all night or you were having a big argument the night before. And when you have drama in your private life, it can leak into your work life. So even if you keep it all together at work, like I, I think I was pretty good at that. I, I think I would lash out sometimes, but the drama I was having in my private life was showing up in my face and in the time I arrived at work and my bedraggled persona. Like I said, our nervous systems are, are connected. And so people could tell I was in great distress and they were kind and supportive of me, but they did not promote me. So I really, I really did work with mostly very kind people, but I couldn't get ahead and use my talents because I just could not keep out of the terrible problems that I was having on my own time. So emotional re-regulation, this is going to be your friend no matter what part of your life you're working on right now, your work, your relationships, your parenting, your neighbors, you know, all of it will require emotional re-regulation. I'm going to talk about that in a second. But what you really need, because, because all that dysregulation, it takes your productivity and you have these bursts of productivity and then it goes down. It's like a roller coaster, right? Productivity like a roller coaster. So sometimes you can get away with that and there's some types of work where bursts is sufficient that you can come in and just like deliver like crazy. Some people are very, very good at creating order out of a bunch of papers or processes and that's a gift too. So there are many gifts 
And you can never really be 100% certain that you have exactly this one, but your job is to start noticing where is that feedback that what you do benefits others. You get to do a lot of things just for yourself. You have a lot of talents and skills, but the gift is the thing that connects you to your greater purpose to be of service to this world in the best possible way. And you'll be clumsy with it and you won't have it right initially. Like you'll be on a path all your life to go towards what it is. Some people are very lucky and they find it early. It took me a long time. I'm living it right now and what I'm doing right now. And it just is so much happier. There's so much more abundant energy every day to do it because it just feels like what I'm made to do. And everybody, is deserves to have that healing trauma is essential for you to discover that in yourself so whatever you do for a living and when, when i was first learning this i saw a parking lot attendant um, they weren't even the attendant they were the guy who sweeps the parking lot and just gets the fallen leaves out of it and they were so kind and uplifting and it was at a hospital i i had a long period where i was in and out of the hospital and i would enjoy so much seeing this parking lot guy because he was kind and friendly to me and he would sort of help me change my I think he might have been a healer actually <laughs> I'd be going into the hospital for some dreadful thing I'm, I'm fine now but I'd be going in and he'd be like hey how's it going <laughs> and there was this funny way he sort of changed my whole attitude to like I'm so grateful that I have health care to deal with this problem my whole attitude would change. He wouldn't lecture me. He didn't say it. He just emanated it. And through working in a parking lot, which I'm sure was not the best paid job, uh, he exhibited joy and optimism that was transmissible. And I received that. I met a lot of really gifted people in when I was in and out of the hospital. But if you've ever been in the hospital, they, they don't all have that. <laughs> it can be rough sometimes. Some people are just like mean. <laughs> They're mean and they don't care. <laughs> I don't know. There's a, there's a, it's a mixed bag out there. But my, my growth in healing is where I stopped focusing so much on how somebody was mean once to me in the hospital. or Well, more than once, okay. And more on... I admire these people so much. I want to be like that. I want to develop the things in myself where I'm that person for somebody else. And they start to have that experience of having their attitude lifted because of some incidental contact with me, even when I don't know I'm doing it. Like, wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be wonderful? So that's what I want to leave you with. If you love this topic, I want to leave you with one of my most uplifting and inspiring videos and it's about specifically what it's like when you've healed and i've got that video for you right here and i will see you very soon